Dan, I, I think it's pretty clear by now that uh, China has become the world's first electro state. And we're seeing in the first half of 2025 some really amazing data that uh, I think validates a lot of the observations that you and the Ember Energy team make about the uh, structural change towards electro tech on the demand side, uh, renewables on the supply side. Is this a blip in the data, you know, a little short term uh, change, or are we? Is this really uh, prove the, the that there is structural change in China's energy system? Yeah, it's an interesting question, Markham. I think uh, it's always hard to call peaks and always hard to call the, what just happened a few months ago like uh, turning points because uh, turning points you can only really see in hindsight, of course. Uh, but it does seem right now what's happening in China. We we do seem to be going through a very unique moment. Uh, we obviously launched a report as Ember a few weeks back on uh, a peak or a, a, a plateauing of fossil fuel demand in the power sector from China. So after years and years of growth of fossil fuels, uh, we actually now are on a, I think it's now more than 14 month plateau of fossil fuel demand, slowly decreasing now even as, as wind and solar take all the growth. Uh, and we're seeing similar uh, messages come out of the transport sector, where the transport sector oil demand has peaked. And we're already talking about serious oil demand displacement with electric vehicle sales going up. And across the board, we see, you know, signposts that fossil fuel demand has stopped growing and most of the growth is going to renewables um, and, and, and clean energy and electrotech. And that latter is quite, quite significant because we've had periods before, of course, in China, you know, year long periods, two year long periods where demand didn't grow as fast as, as people expected or even plateaued to some extent. But this was typically because energy demand overall in China just grew slowly in those years. What we're seeing at the moment, which is quite remarkable, is that demand growth is actually quite significant. But all of that demand growth is now filled in with green. So that makes today different than, for instance, what we had like five, six years ago, where we also had a little bit of a plateau in, in Chinese fossil demand. Uh, that was just because the economy was slow, growing slow, more slowly than people expected, obviously, around Corona times, etc. Uh, but what we're seeing today is actually very healthy, rapid uh, electricity demand growth, more rapid than we've seen over the past, uh, uh, over the past couple of years. Uh, but all of that being filled in with renewables. And that makes us think that we may very well now be in a, in a unique moment where actually China is now peaking in their fossil demand, not because energy demand is peaking, but because uh, all the growth is now taken by renewables. And of course, when first you take all the growth and the next step is you start eating into the existing fossil markets as renewables. One of the things I think that's remarkable about this is how China fits the theory so well. You know, uh, at a, here at Energy Media, we have a, a, a energy transition theory of change. It's built on the idea that uh, electrotech, so uh, EVs and and heat pumps and so on, are innovative disruptions. That is, that they they are now competitive with their fossil fuel equivalents. So, an, you know, an EV is competitive with an ice car, and heat pumps are competitive with gas furnaces. That sort of thing. And what you would expect as these technologies pass their inflection point where they become cost competitive, value competitive, and they begin to accelerate up the hockey stick growth, you would expect to see that the new technologies would begin to push the old technologies out of the market. So it's not just the growth anymore. They've taken all the growth, but now they're actually competing for market share with the with the old technologies and that's the the really striking thing about the chinese data to me is that that it it's performing exactly the way the theory would suggest that it would yeah and and the way that mathematically it needs to pan out of course if you want to push the old system out first you take part of the growth then you take all the growth and then you push the other system into the decline sort of mathematically it's a necessity that that's the order of events and and it's what we're seeing in China just play out quite fast. And that is quite handy for us sort of energy modelers and people in the world because we see it happening in China quite fast where we're seeing it in the West happening a little bit more slowly at the moment. But it's, it's, it's good to see and, and see the confirmation of what is happening, uh, that we're, what we're expecting to happen on the ground in the West as well, now happening in China quite, quite quickly. Uh, and we can learn a lot from that. Like there, there are multiple like dynamics that we're seeing unfolding in China that we can learn a lot from in the West to be, you know, fast followers and, 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 and be actually smarter when we go through this rapid transition, for instance, towards EVs, we're rapidly racing, of course, behind China, but China is definitely ahead. We see many things happening in China that we can learn from 
whether that be how we reconfigure our oil refining sector to pivot away from making road fuels to more chemicals. It is how we think about charging stations and how to incentivize rolling out charging stations across you know, rural areas. I think there's a lot that we can learn from China by looking at it and actually lots of things that we can approve upon compared to what China is doing. And so to some extent, we should also be kind of excited in the West that uh, China is being first here. And that means that we can actually learn from that and be much smarter followers. One of, I, I, I'm fascinated by the way uh, China has become a model for this. You know, you roll out the, uh, the electro tech on the demand side, that then creates demand for more electricity. You know, your electricity demand goes up three to five percent, maybe even, you know, seven, five to ten percent. And then on the demand side, you meet that with uh, that extra demand, mostly with renewables uh, to begin with, and then eventually all with renewables, as you just said. The, my point here is that there are any number of Asian countries who are watching China and saying, that's, what, that's the model for us. It's not, we're not going to stick with the old fossil fuel, the oil, the gas, the coal, none of that. We're, we, want, we want what China's doing. And then China, of course, uh, has the Belt and Road Initiative. It ha has export programs. It, has, it ex exports its technology. It has licensing, all of these things, so that it helps those countries begin to copy China's uh, energy model, energy system model. Uh, would you agree? So this is, I think, one of the key stories of this past year is we can talk about what happens in China and peak fossil fuel demand, yes or no. Uh, but I think the more interesting story actually lies deeper than that, which is that China's exporting, as you put it, this sort of they're exporting the technologies, but even the model of how to organize your energy system now to the rest of the world. Exports are booming to the global south. I mean, by now, I think many of your listeners will be familiar with the Pakistan example and the Chinese solar boom that happened in Pakistan. We're seeing it now taking shape in uh, um, uh, in Africa, where we're seeing solar imports boom. We're seeing it taking place in the Middle East, where solar ex exports from China are booming. And it's not just Chinese technology that's coming in there. We're actually seeing more and more Chinese foreign di direct investments in these countries. And there is a parallel here with the Belt and Roads Initiative and the, actually the, the U.S. Marshall Plan post-World War II, right? Post-World War II, the United States built up an incredible overcapacity of manufacturing for diesel engines, car engines, like for the tanks and the, and the, and the war equipment. And it was able to retool that to then power Europe uh, through loaning money to Europe, borrowing money to Europe, and then they could pay for uh, a U.S. oil and gas uh, kit. Um, this is what we're seeing in China right now, not driven by a war, but just driven by extreme government policy. We, China has built up overcapacity in solar panels and in batteries and in many other pieces of electrotech to the extent, by the way, where solar panels and batteries are now like the manufacturing capacity could meet two net zero scenarios globally rather than one, right? So it's twice as much as we would even need in a net zero scenario. That's how much capacity they've built up. As they're dealing with massive overcapacity and they're kind of setting up an, their own Marshall plan at the moment by going, we have manufacturing overcapacity. We increasingly have a good, healthy financial system that we can push this uh, FDI strategy, right? This, this sort of Marshall Plan strategy. And this is what we're seeing happening across the world. It's not just China selling their technologies, but they're actually coming up with sort of this Marshall Plan-esque loop of finances where they finance the foreign projects, get the money back and get loans uh, 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 in these new uh, economies. And so it's China enabling the rest of the world, and especially the developing economies, to move towards electrotech. But it's also China gaining geopolitical influence with that, much like the Marshall Plan did that with uh, Europe uh, from the U.S. point of view. Uh, Dan, I, I think that the Marshall Plan analogy here uh, deserves its own interview, frankly. I mean, this is, uh, I, I think that's a really good way of explaining what China's up to. But I want to end this interview by making uh, a point just to punctuate the argument that you made. And that is China practices something called industrial diplomacy. And it does all the things that you just said very deliberately. It's part of China's bigger, greater China geopolitical strategy. It sees itself as the rival, the geopolitical rival, and, and eventually the champion uh, in the race against the United States. And the way that it's, it, it perceives itself uh, or it perceives the, the pathway to achieving that goal is through going out to, not competing in North America necessarily, uh, Europe, yes, because they allow that, but really the game is being played in, in the global south. Because what did, what did the United States do? It not only did that in Europe, 
as you mentioned with the uh, Marshall Plan, it did it in Latin America. Mm -hmm. And it made Latin America very dependent on its economically and, and for its technology. And, you know, we had things like the Green Revolution in the 70s, which all was fueled by American technology and, and so on. So this, these are the kind of patterns that in North America were all caught up in, you know, populism and, and, and being angry and so on. Meanwhile, China is simply just eating away at the, at the global energy system and, with its model. It's quite right. It's uh, and, and we seem to be a little bit blind to it because we conceived of this transition as something that would come from the West. Uh, it was sort of controlled by us and we would set the pace. And now China is, is running away with it. It has to be said, though, by the way, is that this is I think it's wrong maybe to think that this is almost like Chinese strategy to target developing markets. I think if they could, they would prefer to sell into North American and European markets more and more and more. It's just that it's it, the strategy is also kind of made uh, for China, or China has to had to adapt its strategy because the U.S. decided to put up tariff walls. The U EU is becoming increasingly skeptical. They build a lot of overcapacity, I'm sure, also with an eye on the U.S. and European markets. And now they just need to divert it. The the, the capital is already sunk on these factories. So now it's just a question of how do we make sure that we still get some money back on this. So it is also our own policies in the West of throwing up trade barriers that is actually kind of seeding the developing markets to China because China is just diverting their uh, their export plans towards the US and going into uh, other markets in the global south. And so to some extent, uh, it is Chinese strategy, but it's also, we also make China do these things with our own trade barriers and, and, and especially because we are don't have an own compelling competitive plan in the global south, uh, China can of course run away with, uh, with uh, energy investment there. Yeah, I made that point uh, in May of uh, 2024, when uh, then President Joe Biden put on the 100% EV tariffs uh, on Chinese EVs, and uh, Canada followed in September. Uh, you know that all it would do is take the that overcapacity, and China would just pivot to the global south, and that's exactly what they've done, and it fits very well with their their overall strategy. Dan, thank you very much. This has been a fascinating conversation. Thanks for having me, Marco.